So warm welcome to everybody on behalf of ORF Center for New Economic Diplomacy. Uh, today's conversation on World Food Safety Day is part of development dialogues that we convene uh, at CNED, where we examine critical issues related to sustainable development and global cooperation. Uh, I'm Vikram Mathur. I'm a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, and today we have an exciting panel uh, to discuss the complex linkages between food safety and human health. How can we cope with increasing foodborne risks to human health, uh, safer food, better health, coping with foodborne risks to human health? Uh, food, food safety is increasingly a public health priority, uh, but food safety is a complex issue and requires systemic thinking. We need to grow and produce food uh, uh, through agriculture and farm practices that is safe, but we also need to keep it safe which relates to how it's stored and distributed. Uh, ensuring food safety is a shared responsibility of governments, food producers and farmers, business operators, but also consumers. Uh, recently, WHO met to discuss an SDG indicator on food safety for stronger food safety accountabilities and reducing the health burden from unsafe food. Food safety is critical to food security and public health and therefore relevant to a number of SDGs. Uh, and to that extent, this is uh, central to the conversations that CNET uh, seeks to convene. Uh, we have four uh, exciting, uh, knowledgeable panelists today, uh, and I'm going to introduce them uh, as I pose questions to them. Uh, first, uh, I want to go to Professor Ramesh Chand. He, he's a member of uh, Niti Aayog. Uh, and Professor Chand, my question to you perhaps is, just to frame the issue, uh, what are the emerging challenges for food safety uh, in India and the region? Uh, and what are foodborne risks to human health that you are most concerned about uh, in your role as a member at Niti Aayog? Uh, thank you, Bikram. Uh, if we look at uh, food system during last uh, two, three decades, the food systems have undergone changes almost uh, everywhere. We have seen big increase in per capita production of plant-based food, livestock food, as well as aquatic food. This increase has been largely achieved by increased use of agrochemical, agrochemical for uh, uh, food nutrition, agrochemical for uh, protection, agrochemical for uh, preservation, for storage, growth hormone, and so many things. So as a result of uses of these agrochemical, uh, in, in, in many cases, depending upon uh, uh, how carefully they are used, they involve changes in biochemical composition of food. And also when we are making use of uh, agrochemical for ripening of food, uh, sometime uh, it also goes as a, as a uh, residue, then it has implication for, 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 for human health. In fact, uh, as uh, most of the developing world was short of food, so there was uh, emphasis on grow more food. That was the goal before all developing, uh, developing entire developing world to address the problem of food and uh, nutrition. But I think uh, in our urge to achieve that goal, we forgot to include another dimension into this. That is that you achieve grow more food, but with grow safe food. So that became a casualty of uh, excessive emphasis on <laughs> grow more food. So uh, we have been uh, 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 recklessly making use of uh, some of the inputs. We have not been paying adequate attention to some of the practices. Uh, we even did not take cognizance that soil health matter for quality and safety of food. We did not pay adequate attention that it is the quality of water which matter for quality of quality of food. So since now we have come out of uh, scarcity largely. So I feel that there is a need to balance this interest of food availability with interest of food safety because higher food which is unsafe may be more dangerous than lower intake of food which is more safe. So I think this is the uh, uh, situation. And now, since public awareness is also increasing, 
uh, uh, food is being associated even with those kind of diseases with which it is not associated <laughs> because that is the kind of uh, i would say uh, 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 public perception that public has becoming so uh, uh, concerned now that they want to see that food which they are consuming is 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 safe uh, they should not be feeling afraid of uh, consuming the food but right now you hear so many unsubstantiated stories also uh, related of food safety so so uh, uh, even in niti yog even with the concerned ministry this is a important concern now that uh, we now pay equal attention to safety aspect as is the attention we have been paying to growth aspect of food so this is how i look at uh, this entire issue of uh, uh, food security and, uh, uh, and 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 food safety uh thank you professor chand uh, i want to move on to uh, dr famida khatun she's the executive director uh, for the center for policy dialogue in bangladesh uh, and ma'am you have worked quite a bit uh, i know on issues related to climate change uh, which is a major driver uh, and and kind of uh, you know ma major change that we are experiencing uh, in most of our systems uh, and in relation to food uh, you know food safety what do you think are the likely kind of interlinkages with uh, with climate change that we need to be concerned about and we need to address thank you very much uh, vikram and i would also like to thank orf for organizing this very timely event um so taking cue from my previous speaker i would uh, focus on as you have mentioned that uh, what are the interlinkages uh, between climate change and food security um and uh, since i'm also an economist i will also highlight some of the economic aspects uh, in the context of uh food security so uh as you have mentioned in the beginning that you know food security is also under threat because of this very um critical event which is uh climate change and in not only in south asia but also in other parts of the world extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and also more uh, intense so events like flood drought cyclone storm these are threatening the food production crops uh, production not only production but also the supply system uh, also because you know reaching out to the people has become also very challenging because of frequent weather changes and as we already know that the number of malnutrition uh, people who are suffering from malnutrition Uh, around the world has increased and also uh, regions like south asia and of course african um, these are the regions where most of the people are uh, suffering from malnutrition and in fact in case of south asia uh, the prevalence of stunting is uh, very high higher than the average so the world average is about 22% whereas in south asia it is over 30% and uh, we also know that uh, south asian countries are also poor and almost one fourth of the total global poor people live in south asia and it is not only the present we are talking about but in future also the number of poor people will increase and it will be in south asia it will be around 40% by 2050 so 40% of the total global you know poor so and this poverty is also directly related to nutritional status and also food security um, and also i mean other activities like act economic activities uh productivity and everything so the whole the food system is related to uh economic activities in the broader sense but it is also linked to other aspects like nutrition i said i mean it is going to have an impact on the education also which in the end is going to have an impact on the productivity so ultimately the whole economic um vulnerability of these countries are going to be um, you know um, challenged or it, it might be increased because um the way we are now uh, progressing in fact if you have followed 
the predictions of food and agriculture organization that they have uh, they are apprehending that because of the frequent weather events, the future food um, production and food availability will be also under challenge because it, on the one hand, the weather is affecting the food production. On the other hand, the demand for food also increasing. So that's a real uh, challenge for the whole of the world. And the other aspect also that apart from the production itself, but the distribution system is not only affected by the climate change, but also the geopolitical system itself. So we, when we talk about food security, uh, we have to also, also combine all uh, important um, uh, indicators or players as well, uh, how the food system is affected and food availability of uh, is impacted. In this regard, I'll just mention uh, a few measures that which can be taken in the short run and also in the medium term. In the short run, as we are observing that food security is becoming is under challenge uh, in the uh, wake of this COVID-19 and also in the wake of, as even though we are doing much better in terms of addressing COVID-19 impact, but we also observe that the, um, the war between Russia and Ukraine has also created some challenges on the food security system itself because the, the supply uh, change has been disrupted. Uh, so availability is under threat. So in this regard, particularly uh, countries, uh, poor countries, less developed countries, middle income countries, they have to prepare themselves so that they're in the short to medium term, their people are not, you know, um, and people don't go hungry. Uh, as you have mentioned that this is also related to many of the SDGs, SDG2 directly, which talks about end hunger, but it was also related to SDG1, reducing poverty, then SDG4, education, SDG3, uh, SDG, uh, 4, 5, all these are, and also of the other SDGs, 12, 13 particularly, this is directly related. So it is, it is so much, I mean, the coverage is so much. So the short term measure is that, and apart from that, domestically countries will also have to take some fiscal measures in the sense that they will have to provide direct support, a direct cash support to the poor and low income households, and also make food available at a an affordable price uh, and so that people immediately can stay afloat they don't go hungry um, but also in this in the medium term we'll also have to think about that um, the, how we can collaborate regionally as well as we talk about collaboration we also uh, we, I also want to mention one thing that when crisis like this uh, come uh, or surfaces then we see that countries, you know, many countries resort to protectionism. Trade protections are imposed so that, you know, they, of course, obviously every government wants to uh, protect their own people. So in doing so, they also put bans on exports uh, of uh, some items, including food items. So that is uh, something which is worrying. So more uh, trade collaboration is also very important during this types of this uh, types of crisis. Um, one and second, also how regionally we can collaborate uh, in case in terms of increasing the yield rates um, in South Asian countries. Uh, the yield rate is much lower than Southeast Asian countries. So, but we have limited land, but more people and you know, population growth is also higher than other developed countries. So that is another area for collaboration. Um, I would also uh, mention regarding the uh, some other economic in uh, measures, for example, I spoke about short term measure in terms of direct support. Another, another support, which is, of course, we don't like that, that is subsidy, that subsidy is giving, uh, given to the agriculture sector, particularly to the farmers, because they are the ones who uh, produce, uh, uh, produce uh, uh, crops and also uh, 
during difficult times, they, this continuation of subsidy has to be ensured because though it's not liked by you know internationally global organizations, uh, for example, WTO is all about reducing uh, barriers and reducing uh, subsidies, but we also see that many European countries provide subsidies to their agriculture sector. So during crisis, we'll have to create that space. And in order to do that also, fiscal space of these countries are really, uh, are very important. Whether they have enough resources, that's another issue. I think it is a broader economic uh, aspects, also economic issues also uh, very much important to address this as much as it is a, cli a climate issue. At this point in time, I want to stop. Maybe we can discuss later on if you have any other questions. Yeah, no, I think thank you very much for that. And I think uh, you very um, effectively trace the kind of linkages with uh, geopolitics, economics, trade issues, and so on and so forth. So I think that's really valuable. Uh, I kind of want to move, I want to move back to, uh, I want to move to uh, now to Dr. Shweta Kandeval. She's a head uh, of nutrition research at the Public Health Foundation of India. And, 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 uh, and obviously, safe food is nutritious food. And my question, ma'am, to you is, uh, is much more about, uh, you know, the vulnerability of specific groups or the agency of specific groups in relation to food safety. Uh, and to that extent, you know, how do you, what do you feel, uh, how are women affected by the changes in our food system and what role uh, can they and should they play, uh, you know, which is unique uh, in this, in this crisis, in this kind of set of issues that we are concerned about. Uh, thank you, Vikram, for pointing that out. I think women literally feed the world. If we, we are talking about the gender lens, it's very, very important to understand that despite often limited access to you know, either local or global markets, they constitute the majority of food producers in the world. And they actually manage their families' nutritional needs as well. Uh, they achieve this despite entrenched gendered inequalities and increasing volatility of food prices. Uh, and therefore, their own food security and nutrition needs often get compromised and neglected. And so uh, the, this discriminatory, the social, cultural norm, uh, this whole system of prevailing, specifically in terms of food systems, it's important to outline. Um, and, and therefore, using your platform, for example, this recent paper by David Gustafs, uh, Gustafsson uh, in 2016 actually uh, drew seven food system metrics of a sustainable nutrition security. And gender was, of course, a very, very important piece. And they said these seven metrics included the food nutrient adequacy, ecosystem stability, food affordability and availability, socio-cultural well-being, resilience, food safety, and waste and loss uh, reduction. So if you see, all these seven levels are actually somewhat uh, related to and impact, uh, get impacted by uh, gender di disparities as well. In fact, the 2020 UN report also showed that 62% of our bilateral funding actually remains gender blind. They, we don't even, uh, you know, consider any specific action and funding for, for these women, uh, the vulnerable group in that sense. Uh, and on top of all this, with increasing climate change, as my previous speakers have alluded to, and rising nutritional challenges, I think all these national surveys, especially in India, for example, the NFHS 5, which has come, uh, and in the wake of recent pandemics, it's important to, to recognize that these challenges are going to affect women in multiple ways. I'm using the analogy of that uh, UNICEF framework here to explain it a bit. But essentially, uh, UNICEF 1990 framework, it's got uh, multiple modifications, but it's it's to the core of this, this issue. And what it does is it, it actually tells you the three uh, or four important uh, uh, pieces or you know I use the analogy of that uh, tripod stand I think the crucible we put on a tripod stand is this uh, nutrition security uh, removal of malnutrition and so on and so forth but these three pillars so to say the first is of course food the availability of food as Dr. Chan was saying that we are becoming uh, better in terms of food availability but the quality also matters and so the food quantity quality and uh, accessibility of that food is that first piece. The second piece is how are we able to make an informed choice about taking the correct food? And women, especially in that context, therefore get affected more because sometimes they are at the, the you know, receiving end of, uh, of things, uh, 
not receiving end of things, sorry. So they essentially will be left out, whether it's educational opportunities, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, more decision making opportunities. And so again, that gets compromised because of that. So income, education, that's the second pillar, those kind of factors which influence the food uh, choices. And the third is the policy piece. The third is the environment piece. Again, even if you talk about climate change or air pollution, the women are definitely disproportionately at a higher burden of taking all these in, like whether they are using fuels, uh, indigenous fuels, and, and uh, therefore exposed to air pollution or indoor air pollution, or in general, uh, they are, they are uh, they are not getting the advanced technological support to be able to uh, you know, uh, get better in terms of uh, the nutritional security, the climate change impact, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's a multi-sectoral action which uh, uh, is acting against women here, which needs to get corrected. So. Thank you so much for that, uh, ma'am. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to move on to Mr. Amanul Rahman. Uh, he's director. Uh, of Care Bangladesh, uh, Director of on Extreme Poverty Issues with Care Bangladesh. Uh, so one of the issues that, you know, that is coming up in conversations uh, is the impact that the pandemic has had on food safety and food security. Uh, obviously, we have, uh, it's the past pandemic that we have an experience of, but, you know, there is also kind of conversation that, uh, that, uh, there will be increased uh, frequency of pandemic, especially uh, related to, uh, you know, transfer from zoonotic transfer and so on and so forth. Uh, but but I would like you to dwell a little bit about on this question of uh, food safety and pandemics. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, what are the sort of, you know, social uh, interlinkages that we need to think about? Yeah, uh, thank you, Vikram. I think uh, obviously uh, pandemic has you know multiple impact on uh, even uh, various areas, but I would say that uh, right at this moment uh, there is no such kind of you know a uh, specific research that you know how uh, uh, the pandemic particularly impacting the safety issues. Uh, but on top of that, we understand that uh, even from our previous discussions that uh, it has, you know, largely impacted the supply chain. And when we talk about the supply chain, even this uh, food storage, these uh, silos, obviously uh, we, we have issues around that in terms of, you know, quality preservation, storage, X, Y, Z. Uh, but countries like uh, Bangladesh, I would say that even uh, the supply chain, which was, you know, highly impacted by uh, during the fast second, Way. we see that even uh, even the dairy farmers uh, they injected their you know this uh, unsold uh, milk uh, on the roads uh, to protest uh, in protest of you know not uh, couldn't selling their uh, produce to the uh, tertiary or greater market and this is not a kind of a new phenomena but uh, the pandemic exaggerated the whole vulnerability of supply chain and it give us a kind of innovations that even uh, in the even resilience is not a kind of you know a, uh, uh, a specific kind of perspective we need to have a kind of holistic view mm -hmm. so even uh, it includes obviously climate if it, it includes the other kind of you know uh, infrastructure economic social and all those kind of you know, aspects so that even uh, the whole supply chain could absorb the shocks and stresses like the pandemic we see obviously this is a kind of very new phenomena of, uh, for us uh, so people may not, you know, predict the whole thing. So this is number one. Number two is that uh, we understand that uh, uh, countries like Bangladesh and you know the whole South Asia and even in Asia, I think uh, the 80 percent of even uh, it is said even by FAO that even the whole food production is mostly contributed by the you know smallholder farmer. So and uh, this is a smallholder farmer that means they do not have a uh, lot of uh, ownership and control over this you know food uh, inputs including land xyz and uh, even they do not have uh, much choices particularly to you know uh, uh, to uh, even uh, follow uh, all the standard uh, even um, specifications growing process xyz so so if the smallholder farmers are not taken into account, because in some of the discussions, we see that even there is a perception that food safety is mostly around, you know, 
the issues of uh, you know processing and uh, all those kind of stuff but obviously you understand that production yeah. is also a concern is a is a major concern on and processing is also is an issue particularly where the food governance is very weak uh, in countries like us even uh, in the processing we see that even uh, use of chemical use of you know um, uh, even uh, uh, even some banned uh, chemical materials particularly during the seasonal period we see that early ripening is a kind of you know temptation uh, of the you know food businesses for, for example this is summer so and uh, the temptation of consumer is also is a kind of you know uh, issue which triggered the businesses to even uh, shorten the ripening period for example use of carbide yeah, for you know mango ripening or this kind of food, food ripening obviously this has uh, health hazards and safety issues on the other hand uh, when there is a uh, supply uh, kind of you know challenges uh, during pandemic or any other this kind of issue obviously it, it, there is a uh, the storage and this kind of uh, infrastructure is uh, not at large uh, uh, in, in this kind of country so people uh, if there is no other option so people like to fi find that kind of you know easiest uh, kind of you know catch so use of formalin for preservation of fish xyz i think that is also kind of you know health kind of you know concerns for us but the thing is that those stakeholders who are you know uh, associated with this you know processing they are not the farmer or the fisher folk so i think but uh, as uh, we also by the way we also have uh, this food safety act uh, that was enacted in 2013 but uh, the instruments is there even uh, there are some you know um, uh, penalty and other kind of you know exercises that the authority can uh, exercise uh, but the presence and the monitoring mechanism and the overall hr is very weak to monitor the whole market so i think the, the governance and control is also in, also an issue uh, to address the whole situation thank Did you that? so much for that uh, and i think what is what what is coming out with with these conversations uh, and from each of the panelists is just the complexity of the issue itself and the kind of interlinkages and levers that in some sense need to be uh, uh, tweaked uh, or, or or managed to actually create uh, uh, safe food systems uh, so I think that's uh, and I want to kind of go have a second round of questioning and it's going to be uh, much more kind of uh, solution oriented uh, and uh, and I'll start it off with uh, Professor Chand again uh, and, and you know ask you to dwell a little bit on global institutions and processes uh, uh, particularly for example those related to the conference of the parties or the WHO uh, but as Dr. Uh, Khatun pointed out even trade related global processes that need to be mobilized uh, in support of uh, resilience and uh, coping with food safety challenges. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, I would prefer to again uh, stick myself to food safety aspects, though there are several dimensions of uh, food and nutrition and uh, health. And uh, coming to international processes, uh, uh, we have institutions and we have processes. First, I come to institutions. The major institutions which deal with food safety aspect at international level are WHO and FAO. The primary job of WHO and FAO in terms of food safety is development of protocols and to undertake advanced studies related to food safety aspects. So WHO, you go to WHO side, you will find that there is rich literature which just uh, tells us about uh, what kind of uh, uh, bacterial infections can follow from food, what kind of viral infections, what kind of uh, aflatoxin uh, uh, can follow from food. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, 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 FAO, uh, it is more uh, pre-harvest, uh, not only post-harvest. You just find pre-harvest that uh, uh, it talks of uh, good agriculture practice from uh, food safety uh, uh, point of view. It also cautioned the world that uh, that uh, the, the 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 residue of uh, metal, uh, heavy metals, uh, metal oils, 
uh, what kind of risk that can pose to human health. Uh, these are not infectious diseases, but these are life-threatening kind of diseases which it can cause. Uh, there may be damage to kidney, it may be damage to liver, uh, respiratory system, <laughs> uh, brain, uh, and even uh, deadly diseases like cancer. Uh, much of this is uh, related to uh, 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 the residue on food um, and some kind of hazardous uh, contaminations uh, uh, of uh, food. So if you look at FAO, again, you just find that FAO uh, developed the protocols and FAO also sensitized global cities about the need to pay attention uh, not only to post-harvest uh, aspect of food safety, but also much of the food safety originate in the in the pre-harvest uh, uh, stages of uh, food uh, production. Uh, it begins from seed that if the quality of seed is not good, if seed itself is infected, you will find that the food that we will get out of that seed is also likely to uh, suffer from uh, those seed-borne uh, seed uh, diseases. Then we have uh, 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 WTO. Uh, it has again uh, agreement related to uh, SPS, sanitary and uh, phytosanitary uh, agreement, uh, even technical uh, barrier to trade. So it also uh, keep the provisions that any country can restrict the trade of those commodities, which may pose any threat to human life livestock or even plant life so as far as international uh, and they also have been uh, developing the processes we have uh, hash up we have codex uh, alimentarius so like that you find that uh, there are uh, processes uh, uh, developed by international uh, organization little bit about uh, this uh, cop uh, uh, again as far as safety aspect is uh, concerned you see, agriculture has a unique relationship with climate change. It not only affects climate change, it also gets affected by the climate change, which is unlike many other sectors. Therefore, we need to pay extra attention when it comes to the relationship between climate change and agriculture. We all know that meaning of climate change is that, uh, that uh, temperature is going up, humidity is affected, uh, rainfall patterns are affected, and when these three dimensions are affected, they result in new kind of uh, uh, outbreak of diseases, new kind of pest, new kind of vectors. So, so I think that COP is also uh, playing uh, its uh, role in terms uh, sensitizing global uh, community that agriculture matter a lot for climate change and climate change also matter a lot for agriculture not only for production even for safety even for outbreak of diseases and pests so this is how these uh, broadly these are the uh, four uh, 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 institution uh, and the processes that they are following by taking commitment of the country by setting up some uh, multilateral uh, agreement, by coming up with the suggestion to put a check against transboundary transmission of uh, uh, pests and uh, uh, diseases, particularly FAO doing a lot of work even in South Asia, not only on plant and livestock, even in case of fisheries, that there are some transboundary kind of diseases because pests and uh, insect and diseases, they don't recognize uh, uh, national boundaries, they are for us only. So they, they, they just go through, if something happened to wheat or rice in India, it is likely to spread to Pakistan or to Bangladesh and vice versa. So that's why that uh, FAO has uh, uh, worked out the uh, uh, protocol, similarly related to livestock, related to fishery, they are developing the protocol to address uh, these challenges. So that's all I would like to say at this stage. Thank you, Professor Chan. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to move to uh, uh, Dr. Ka uh, Khatun again. Uh, and ma'am, you, uh, in your earlier intervention, traced the linkages to the SDGs and also to uh, global trade and geopolitics. Uh, and are some of those, uh, you know, how can we strengthen the commitment uh, 
to food security in some of these global processes that you have already highlighted uh, are critical. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so what I have uh, spoken in the first phase of my discussion, I'll just reiterate okay. some of this and maybe elaborate a little bit. Uh, because um, climate change is a global issue and uh, many of the impacts and the causes of climate change are uh, originated from the developed countries because of their economic activities. The world is suffering, particularly the poorer countries who are, which are at the receiving ends. So therefore, the global commitment on um, finance has to be um, fulfilled. As we know that the uh, global commitment for a climate fund equivalent to $100 billion, that has not been fulfilled. Countries made commitments, but disbursement has not happened. And also we see that when you uh, decipher the composition of climate fund is that most of the funds are towards mitigation and less is uh, for 30%, uh, about 30% is for the adaptation measures. We know that mitigation measures which are undertaken by the developed countries because they have emitted so much the uh, greenhouse gases have been emitted by them and still being emitted so they, because for their activities the funds are being flown there so whereas for the for the poorer countries least developed countries developing countries who are the victims there they need funds for adaptation so fund flow has to be increased uh, that is one and that's why the global financial landscape and global architecture of climate finance has to be changed that uh, the reform has to happen there and also the fund for innovation and development and also technological development has to be um, uh, boosted up because uh, we are talking about adaptation and also to some extent mitigation all the countries are committed to reduce uh, greenhouse gases as part the paris climate agreement so for all these technological upgradation has to be in place and for that huge amount of resources are required and also the technology transfer component which are enshrined in the WTO agreements. So that has to be also implemented. Of course, talking about WTO, we know that uh, this is not a forum anymore where things are moving. I mean, that movement is very slow. And uh, for the last over two decades or so, the negotiations are not going anywhere. But some of the commitments are there. And I would say that the while we don't see much movements regarding the positive uh, uh, measures which are there, but in case of some measures which have harmful impact, for example, standards, uh, then uh, other uh, border measures, those are being now either have been devised and uh, in many cases those are implemented. My previous speaker uh, has mentioned about the you know SPSs and TBTs. Of course, the WTO clearly um, talks about protecting the environment and also protecting the interest of uh, this uh, of countries that so that these standards are not used unjustifiably not just used as trade protection measure those are there um, clearly but we see that many countries do use that so they uh, they take advantage of these measures, you know, SPSs that sanitary and phytosanitary measure, trade related uh, barriers, and also border measures that you know when you want to export, then there are stringent um, uh, scanning of or measurement of the uh, carbon com content of any product. So those are you know used as trade barriers, and for those, of course, countries will have to abide by all these measures so that we can you know, we can um, make a transition to the you know, clean world. However, the countries which have limited capacities, financial and technological, they will have to be uh, given time and support so that they can adapt 
uh, the, to that situation. This was, these are uh, some of these um, global issues, of course. And in my previous section also, I talked about regional cooperation because uh, within the region, there is a lot of potential within South Asia, as we know, much discussed uh, issue is that the trade among the South Asian countries is only 5%. Uh, however, if you look at uh, the ASEAN trade among the ASEAN region is 25%, among the European Union, more than 60%. So where are we? We have a large population size in this uh, part of the world, and there are a lot of opportunities. And then the opportunities can be collaboration in many areas, including climate change and trade and food security and all. So with this, I would like to end here. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Khantun. I think uh, uh, I want to move now to uh, back to uh, Dr. Kandeva, Kandelwal. Uh, and uh, ma'am, we have talked about global institutions and regional cooperation, uh, but also, you know, in line with, with, with what you said uh, in your first intervention, you know, what is the role that kind of communities, uh, community organizations, even households can play uh, to ensure uh, food safety, uh, nutrition security, and good health. Uh, you know, how do we how do we strengthen those capacities at the grassroots, particularly of women who, as you pointed out, are have the maximum agency as when it comes to food and responsibility. Right. Uh, thank you again. I think this is this is very important, and you outlined yourself that this is a solution uh, oriented section that we are we are talking into. But it's important for me to just put some numbers here to understand the the you know sort of uh, volume or burden of the problem that we are dealing with. It's about eight hundred million people that are undernourished in the world. Uh, sorry, uh, that lack food in the world, and many of these also many more in addition to these have also got several deficiency diseases. And 76% of our world population actually derives most of their daily nutrients from plants. And climate change or pandemics and you know disruptions in the services, all these are going to just exacerbate this number and, and just make people you know, push them towards food insecurity, both in terms of quantity as well as quality, something which we all as experts are delving on, on uh, how to tackle. And therefore, when I was thinking of or listening to the other speakers here, the, the synonym, the acronym which came to my mind for summarizing the solutions per se to tackle food insecurity is perfect. F-E-P-E-R-F-E-C-T. So for me, the solution lies in this word, which is perfect. And for P, I mean the policy, because there is very important need, as most of my other distinguished colleagues have already outlined, a multi-sectoral, a coordinated, strong leadership at all levels. You know, something which is integrating both nutrition, environment, but also other domains like agriculture, education, public health, uh, water, sanitation, trade. Uh, one example was portion vaticas, for example, from India. Uh, last to last year, there was this portion ma in India, that September month, which we celebrate as portion ma. And in that, one of the themes was to have more and more engagement from the communities to set up portion vaticas. And what that essentially meant was use lands within, identify lands within communities and use that for, uh, you know, teaching school kids, uh, helping women and, and uh, uh, vulnerable people uh, to get access to nutritious foods. The second, so P is policy, therefore. E for me stands for education. I don't think educate without that, uh, you know, that IEC, BCC, we use multiple ways, uh, but without the education piece or awareness piece, all this is going to fall flat. Even if we make policies, but people are not aware about these, they are not educated, they are not empowered, I think uh, that's very, very crucial. Uh, across all tiers, across all layers, across genders, as well as groups. And here I'm not talking about education only of the masses. I think we as, a, as researchers also need to be educated about certain other domains which impact nutrition. There are other uh, policymakers which also need to you know, take a lot of other factors in. So it's important that education be taken at all levels. So E is my education. R for me stands for relevant research. I think all of us are doing research in some space or the other, but it's important and it's timely now to get these data gaps addressed, have this local research collated, um, you know, focusing on local solutions. Uh, something which is happening in Bangladesh, for example, 
it's it may be very relevant to certain parts in india but not to the others so what is the local so these examples are very very important to share very very important to cross uh, collaborate and and interchange so i think r for me is relevant research uh there's also f which is funding and i think uh farmida already said that funding is crucial and i completely agree with her i think financial support especially for gender transformative work for climate change for things which are going to impact food security are again very crucial how are we going to ensure that funding is sustained right uh, we see that the budgets get cut sometimes for nutrition or for health um, sometimes they are increased in certain domains but to these smaller aspects some sustainability or or means are also very crucial so f for me is funding e the second e is for effective engagement i think all of us coming together from different walks of life uh, sir dr chand representing a policy maker or um, you know there are researchers here there are economists here so all of us coming together in this um, Uh, this uh, desire to make an impact on on food and security or educate people about safety i think that effective engagement of all stakeholders is very important but keeping people at the heart of this issue so that again for me is the second e c for me is capacity building i think vikram you and famida both alluded to this earlier even the flws the uh, you know frontline workers uh, we, uh, the people who are who actually we are talking about climate resilient or smart agriculture there are issues there are examples of uh, you know permaculture for example from nepal uh, bangladesh a lot of fisheries how are they doing that sustainably how are we going to learn this collate this that's also very important in terms of capacity building we know there are research papers which are telling you that motivated very highly uh, passionate uh, workers make a huge difference in terms of the knowledge uptake in terms of people changing their habits so capacity building to Uh, make not only strengthen the education piece which i outlined earlier but all, also in general creating this pool of local resources is very crucial i feel and last but not the least is t which is technology i think still in india there's a huge scope of using technology for solutions we all are going digital in so many different ways but still we are not being able to map like gis there are such magical tools out there for you know you wear a patch and i will eat something and i will come to know what my sugar level is for example right now so why can't we use technology for public health and for for these kind of uh, you know enable solutions for example use this to communicate with stakeholders you know there is this uh, whole uh, decision support system these days a lot of research going on there uh, your own paper in fact about uh, the ors piece on combating climate change with sustainable food systems was outlining adaptive and uh, resilient and um, you know mitigation strategies also talked about technology this krishi helpline the women helpline how can we connect this and make a platform for identifying these vulnerable population and giving them a uh, ready uh, you know sort of access to help uh that's also something important uh, again technology for mentorship programs covid has taught us that schools can happen online so so can mentorship and other things also of course in some limited capacity but yes let's use that uh in terms of time in terms of resource so they look up crunch these things can come really handy so with that vikram i think my solutions are perfect <laughs> thank you no i think definitely that was a very comprehensive uh, way of capturing uh, this conversation uh, and thank you so much for that uh, i'm going to now move to uh, to uh, mr amanur rahman uh, and and sir again sticking to this uh, whole kind of uh, question of uh, uh Of, of solutions, you 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 talked about the Food Safety Act. We have already talked about uh, um, global policies. Uh, so perhaps uh, maybe you know I can we I can ask you to think a little bit more about uh, the role that national uh, stakeholders can play uh, in relation to uh, for shared accountability uh, related to food safety and and especially you know how does it link to uh wider issues of of poverty reduction and and you know the kind of the zero hunger goal uh uh a little bit so over to you yeah thank you again uh obviously we know that uh, this uh, from production processing to distribution and consumption i think uh, even the disposal i think uh, this is uh, what they are it is mostly managed by the private sector and uh, while mentioning private it means the individual private like the small holder farmers and corporate private and obviously um, uh, 
at the production stage uh, as uh, lots of small holder farmers are over there so in, i think the government even uh, it's not uh, a, even a individual thinking there are literatures around there that a government need to support the small holder farmers to promote safe production particularly you know less use of pesticide chemical fertilizer xyz but uh, because um, otherwise even uh, even bangladesh is a uh, um, uh, apart from you know grain is still a food deficit country so there is a kind of you know art from the government to grow more food and that also affect the whole production and you know this entire food system so i think that, that could be that would be the you know first um, uh, concern so far we have some kind of incentives uh, both fiscal and other technological kind of incentives but this is uh, very uh, low in terms of demand and this is not, uh, this is one aspect second thing is that the market governance the private sector who basically uh, uh, process transport and distribute this uh, uh, perishable non perishable other kinds of item i think over there a, a a prudent monitoring and compliance system needs to be in place for example for supply chain we see that there are alternative even during the pandemic you see that government came up with a different solution for example we have railways india has a you know the largest railway um, in the in the whole world so they came up with a new kind of mechanism so that the uh, producers can be transport from the farm to the uh, plate directly even there was even uh, last time we see that a mango special train that can carry perishable mangoes from the periphery to the central market on the other hand we also see pandemic also gave us a kind of you know new way of thinking alternative kind of modalities and digitization came up a kind of you know new option e-commerce we see lots of uh, enterprises uh, even coming up particularly led by the uh, young people even this uh, kind of you know from business to business model we see that even farmer to consumer kind of model where people can even directly source a, a live stock or some kind of you know a bit high value product directly from the farm so that they get a kind of you know safe and kind of you know more consumable kind of food i think the government also need to promote this kind of uh, uh, even alternative uh, sourcing uh, mechanism so that safe food could be uh, even delivered at the doorstep and um, obviously um, uh, this regulation mechanism we already said that so that need to be decentralized so that uh, uh, at the even uh, grassroots level those kinds of uh, even instruments uh, and even all those kind of uh, issues uh, uh, to be in place and on the other hand both the consumers and the producers they also need to be sensitized make aware of this kind of you know challenges impacts of this kind of you know unsafe uh, food production and consumption and also what are the instruments uh, that in place and what supposed to they do to in response to uh, uh, this kind of uh, even uh, uh, practices yeah no, I think thank you so much for that, uh, and and uh, it's a very it's been a really rich rich conversation, uh, and obviously the first thing uh, that uh, or the most important thing that's really coming out is that ensuring food safety is a shared responsibility, uh, and and it's a complex issue. Uh, we have been able to talk quite a bit about what are the kind of global linkages, uh, whether it's to uh, the role of WHO, the Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, the conference of the parties related to climate change, but also WTO, trade agreements, uh, transfer of technology. So many of these kind of global uh, um, actions, both in the context of the implementation of SDGs, but many other uh, issues uh, have, have come out. Uh, it's also a responsibility of governments uh, and, and who are setting agricultural policies uh, and who are setting health policies uh, and a lot of... Uh, interesting insights in that domain. Uh, but definitely smallholder farmers, food producers, uh, and, and what can happen uh, at the level of food production uh, and is, is, is really critical. Uh, and that requires both agency uh, at those, uh, amongst those uh, actors, but also uh, 
government support for them. Uh, and then finally, I think um, we can't forget the private sector, uh, especially the private sector plays a strong uh, role in both the production and distribution of food. Uh, and and uh, and it's not just a matter of setting the right standards, uh, but also uh, supporting the private sector uh, to meet these standards. Uh, and then finally, I think what was really exciting uh, is is the conversation around uh, what needs to happen at the level of communities and households, uh, and particularly uh, how can we strengthen the role of uh, women uh, in 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 the uh, pursuit of food safety uh, uh, as they are both. Uh, involved actively in the production of food, but also they are uh, the primary, uh, res you know, responsibility of, of nutrition uh, for their families uh, and and, uh, and communities. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to all the, the panelists for joining us today. Uh, and and uh, yeah, a, a big thank you from on behalf of ORF and CNET. Uh, and uh, I hope to continue to have these conversations with you. Uh, in the coming uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.